So to begin, I just want to thank all of our viewers who are joining us now or later in the day. Um, thank you so much for joining. We truly appreciate your presence and your engagement with us. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Iman Ali. I'm the Policy and Programming Coordinator for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Um, if I can speak briefly, MPAC's mission has always been to improve the public understanding of American Muslims by engaging with government, media, and communities. Um, we've been around for a very long time, and I hope that many of you have had the positive impact of, of engaging with us. But much as we here at MPAC serve to secure and maintain the well-being of American Muslims, our guests tonight are also fighting to keep another pop vulnerable population safe and well. So let's dive right in to who our guests are. Today, we have with us Dr. Heather El Sahabi, who was born in Baghdad, Iraq in 1981 and came to the US when he was 40 days old. He attended Michigan State University's College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed his residency in emergency medicine from Botsford, from Botsford General Hospital. Dr. Heather El Sahabi has bravely been serving on the front lines of Michigan's COVID-19 pandemic by valiantly serving his Dearborn community. Our second guest is Dr. Ehsan Ali, who was born in Rawalpindi, Pakistan, and has been practicing medicine in the US since 1992. Dr. Ali has been a keystone in his Eastern Kentucky community and has been the recipient of several accolades, including the Patient's Choice Awards, Eastern Kentucky's Best of the Best, and various recognition for his work on opioid addiction and diabetes. Dr. Ali will be sharing with us his insight on combating the COVID-19 in rural America and how hospitals must prepare for the weeks to come. As always, our moderator will be the lovely Salamo Mariotti, president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And Salam, I'm gonna pass the torch over to you, so go ahead and begin. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Iman, for uh, being our trailblazer on this uh, webinar series. Uh, excellent work in terms of leading us uh, as we're engaging uh, our society as American Muslims, uh, we're engaging the society to make a positive social impact so that Islam and Muslims are known for who we are and, and, and the contributions and America recognizes the vital contributions of its Muslim communities. And two people that are representing these kinds of uh, vital contributions are uh, doctors uh, Ali and Saadi. Uh, I welcome you both to our webinar series. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate that. So tell, tell us a little bit more specifically about the kind of work that you're doing right now. Um, I, I know, I know the, the general work that, that Iman had outlined in the introduction, but you're on the front lines. And, and first of all, thank you for your service. Uh, I consider you to be the, the people, along with the healthcare workers uh, that are in day in and day out, uh, exposing themselves to danger. Um, you are sacrificing your own lives so that uh, we can be free and we can, we can survive this, uh, this storm of the virus. So tell us a little bit about each of your work. So I have uh, two outpatient clinics and I work in the emergency room as well as inpatient services in the hospital. Uh, we are very lucky that we have Appalachian Regional Hospital organization behind us um, who have been helping us from day one. Um, from day one, since it has been announced, um, we were given all the preventive measures. We are having meetings almost every week with our coordinators. Uh, the nurses are having meeting with us. Um, and the chain of command is very, very well organized. Uh, we have learned a lot from the other states. Um, there's not much infection in here yet because we are very rural, um, but we are learning from the other states. Our governor has been helping us a lot because the organization is so big. Uh, we are in close contact with the governor and he has been helping us. Um, I have been seeing patients um, not very many in my clinic. Most of my work now is telemedicine in the clinic, but when I work in the emergency room, that is the toughest part um, where I see patients all day long and all night long. 
And then in patients, the patients who are really, really sick, the patients who have COVID-19, those are the patients whom we have to treat. And uh, from the rural to the urban, uh, Dr. Asadi, uh, you probably uh, have a different picture in terms of what's happening in, in Michigan right now, which uh, I believe is on the top five of the states that are dealing with the, with the worst of the number of uh, people infected with the coronavirus. Uh, yes, um, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, our area has been very hardly hit. Um, our particular hospital, which is uh, one of the Beaumont hospitals, um, had the highest uh, you know, amount of uh, COVID patients that, to the point where we were holding severely sick patients in the emergency department because there was no more room in the hospital. We're having to send these patients out to other Beaumont facilities and outside of other Beaumont facilities in order to kind of free up the emergency department um, so that we can see the influx of patients coming in. Um, we're, you know, right there on the front lines trying to determine who needs to be hospitalized, who needs to go home and avoid being exposed. Um, and uh, we're, you know, trying our best to distinguish you know, without trying to harm anybody. Um, and, you know, there are going to be times where we're, we are sending people home and they do come back uh, sick. And, um, you know, that's, that's the idea of kind of flattening the curve that everybody talks about is, you know, if everybody was to come in all at once, uh, it would have been uh, a, a huge disaster. But thankfully, most people have been following the, um, you know, self-isolation, um, you know, home quarantining so that we are able to flatten the curve because, um, you know, if it was any other way, it would have been a lot worse than what it has been now. Um, you know, besides, uh staying at home and washing our hands and uh, remaining six feet apart and wearing masks and gloves now. Are there other measures that we should be taking or considering um, in, in terms of our safety? And uh, do you see some of the, um, some of the uh, therapy that's coming out with certain medicines working um, in, in terms of your patients? What we have seen is that um, we have tried um, azithromycin and um, the other medicine, um, but it has not given us much success. Um, we just had our conference today with our um, board of medicine, and they are going to look into other medicines, the anti-retroviral, anti-viral medications, um, and maybe they will approve that thing for a massive use. Uh, we have not used them yet. Uh, we have been using the azithromycin and the anti-malarial medications, uh, the Plaquenil, um, and, but we did not have much success with that. Uh, I would say, you know, at this time, because this thing is so new and has been wreaking so much havoc, uh, it's, it's, very difficult to say right now what works and what does not work. We're trying to do uh, supportive care, trying to you know treat people as you know as good as we can um, with the information that we know, and that information is changing and uh, getting updated on a regular basis. Uh, what I would ask people to be cautioned about, so to take caution with, is you know you're going to see a lot of. Uh, messages coming through and voice messages and ar long articles of people acting like they know how to treat this thing. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I have no problem saying, even as a physician, I don't know. And we're just dealing with the information we have and just treating people as we see them. Yes, you know, people, when they're sick, we're going to throw everything we can at them to try to get them out. But to say that one thing is curative versus another, uh, you know, this is a virus and it's been, it's, a, it's an enigma and we're, we're trying our best, but until studies come out, I, I don't recommend anybody fall into the trap of accepting, you know, just all the information that they see on the internet or in text messages and all these home therapies that people talk about. You know, today, uh... I read that uh, George Stephanopoulos, the uh, commentator on ABC News and former aide to uh, uh, President Bill Clinton, tested positive 
uh, for the coronavirus. Tom Hanks, uh, another celebrity, tested positive. We hear about celebrities testing, yet most of the people I know who say, you know, I'm feeling a little bit down and I called my doctor, but they're telling me just to stay home. So who's getting tested and how does one get tested if, if your doctor is uh, telling you to, you know, just, just uh, bear the brunt right now? What we are doing in our community is that if you are having symptoms, if you are having high grade fever, if you are having shortness of breath, if you are having chest pain, the flyers which we have sent out into our shops like Walmart, which is our main shop around here, and, and different churches. And we have told them that if you have these symptoms, you need to come to the hospital and get tested. We have one hospital here in our area where we are doing the testing and it's a sent out. We get the results. Initially, we were getting it in seven days. Now we are getting it in three days. Um, but the most of the patients, even if they are getting positive and they are not having symptoms such as high grade fever or severe shortness of breath, we are sending them home. But the health department is following them rigorously um, because we have meetings with the health department and they tell us, Dr. Ali, you told us about that patient. We have been going to their house. They are quarantined. This is how we are doing the quarantine. So the things are working very nicely around here. And the only reason it's working nicely around here is because the community is very, very small. And, and, uh, and everyone is really afraid. Everyone is in a panic mode kind of a thing. So the things are working very nicely. Initially, we had some problem with social distancing, but when our governor came out and at once um, put his foot down with the things, that meant a lot to the people. Um, and, and you can see that I was reading about the nurse who is who has made the graph between Kentucky and Tennessee just with a two weeks difference of social distancing. Um, the, um, the amount of positive tests in Tennessee are almost 550,000 and we have only 200,000, uh, 20,000, sorry, 55,000, 20,000. So that's a, that's a huge difference um, what it makes by just doing the social and the, all the flyers which we have made in the hospital, we are giving it out in the ER is, it's just social distancing and how to keep yourself clean. There's no big science to that. And, and I think the, the easier words we use, the people understand it much better. And, and Dr. Saadi in, in Michigan, uh, one of the highest uh, rates of the infection and, and fatalities. And, um, and I saw a graph last week that showed that even though African Americans are, let's say, 15% of the population. They're almost a third of the fatalities. So it seems that many of our um, racial uh, and socioeconomic um, minorities, um, those in the lower socioeconomic sta status and, and racial minorities, such as African Americans, are bearing the brunt of these fatalities. Um, so how do you see it from your standpoint? So. Um... The, the majority, I would say, of, of my patients that come through the emergency department at our facility are African American. Um, and so I, I see that firsthand that even before anybody else said it, I noticed it myself that, man, this thing is really affecting our African American brothers and sisters and, and, and why. Um, and my, my, you know, with, this is just kind of my own thing and just kind of hearing what other people are talking about is unfortunately a lot of these people are coming from, uh, you know, poor uh, socioeconomic status uh, and, you know, lack of access to actual maintenance health care. And so a lot of these people who don't think they have a lot of medical problems, there's a high prevalence of high blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea, who, uh, uh, in these populations, and that puts these people at higher risk for not just contracting the disease, but actually having the you know large negative effects of it. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, mention uh, uh, on top of what, what Dr. Ali was mentioning, so at our facility we have a drive-through uh, that you know uh, uh, their PCPs are asking patients to go through to quote unquote, get tested, uh, because of the lack of testing material, we aren't really doing a lot of testing. And, and from my own experience, this may not be a, a popular uh, sentiment, but 
the test result doesn't, other than for epidemiolo epidemiologic or, or data purposes, doesn't really change anything. If you're positive, you're going to go home and isolate if you're not in, in an extreme um, uh, form of symptoms. If you're negative, you're going to go home and we're going to ask you to quarantine anyway. Uh, from a data perspective, yes, it's important so we can figure out how to deal with this. But a lot of people want to get tested. And I tell you, listen, you look fine. You don't need the test. The test is not going to change anything. The result is going to be the same. Go home and, and self-isolate because we're not going to do anything different. Now, if you develop severe symptoms, severe shortness of breath, like you was mentioning, severe weakness, then absolutely come back. And several of those patients did come back and they did worsen. Many of them did well at home. What about capacity at your hospital? So, uh, Dr. Ali, um, you know, Kentucky is, is, is ahead. Uh, and I think like California, we're, we're ahead of the, the game, if you will, in that we started uh, the, the stay at home order early. We didn't wait uh, for the situation to get out of hand. Uh, so we're ahead of, of the curve in, in the sense that we're not suffering from a capacity uh, problem. But states like Michigan, uh, New York, uh, other places might be suffering. And so there was this idea that certain states would lend uh, ventilators, other protective gear, equipment to states where there is a capacity, a shortage in, in terms of capacity. Is that, is that something that hospitals ever talk about? Do you, do you deal with associations or any, any public health officials are discussing that in your respective states? In the Appalachian Regional Healthcare Organization, we discussed this thing because when the New York um, pandemic started and um, there were a lot of deaths in, uh, in New York and uh, Governor Cuomo came on, on television about the ventilators, we really got afraid that as soon as it starts coming down, we will need that thing. Because in our hospital, we, we have only six or eight ventilators. We have 10 BiPAP machines. But if the, um, the ventilators come to be needed more, then we have talked with other hospitals um, in the area that whoever needs more, we will. And then all our home health organizations, we have talked with them, our um, um, nursing homes where the ventilators are used, we have talked with them that if needed be, we can use their ventilators. Uh, one floor of the hospital, we have changed into the COVID-19 floor um, where we have placed ventilators, where we have the nurse especially trained for that. So, um, so it all depends on, I think very much depends on organization. I think we, uh, we learned quickly from other states um, and um, the organization did very, very well about that. That helps us a lot, the doctors and the nurses, uh, because it comes from the top down and it has been helping us a lot. Uh, I do have to say that I, don't have, I have not had any uh, direct conversations with regards to that, but I do know there was a point where we were down to uh, literally two or three ventilators left in, in our uh, facility. Thankfully, you know, we're part of a, a big system uh, that is Beaumont, uh, and so, you know, whatever strings they pulled, thankfully they were able to get to the point where we were also at a point where we, we were starting to get people off of the ventilator and, and you know, getting those back into uh, circulation. So uh, we did not get to that point um, where we were, you know, without equipment, but, you know, if, if we did not flatten that curve, uh, we would have had a big problem. Um, yesterday, former Secretary of Education, William Bennett, um, who was part of the George, uh, first George Bush, the senior administration, um, was talking about this uh, epidemic, but he was, uh, he, was, he, was, he was concerned more about the panic uh, than about the virus itself, than about the pandemic. Um, and he was sort of uh, making a comparison that this is nothing more than the, than, than the flu, and we should put things in perspective. So what, what do you, what, you know, what's your response to people like that? He's off, obviously, he's supporting this notion that we need to get back uh, and, and bring back the economy uh, slowly, but we should start sooner rather than later. Do you see that as politicizing 
this healthcare issue? And if so, what, what should be uh, our response in, in terms of the, the political back and forth that we see in Washington? You know, everyone is hurting. Everyone is hurting. Um, economy wise, we all are hurting. We are not seeing patients. The hospitals are not seeing patients. Um, we all are hurting. But you mean non I, non COVID nineteen patients? Non COVID nineteen. We our surgeries are all right. all surgeries have blocked. All our traumas have blocked. Orthopedic surgery has blocked. Everything. These ORs are closed. Um, that is hurting us a lot. But the thing is this that this is an emergency. It is not like flu. It is absolutely not like flu. For flu, we have treatments. For this, we have no treatment. All the treatments which we are using is not giving us very good results. So opening up the economy very early and, and stopping the social distancing, we will have a much bigger second wave. Um, and you can see that in other countries, there is a second wave, then there's a third wave. So no need to start the economy earlier than what it's needed, earlier than the infectious disease specialist at CDC are saying, let's, let's not do that thing. Because we have seen the consequences of already delaying this thing. Um, and now we are, we are going to hurt more if we stop it early. Uh, from from my, my experience, you know, coronavirus is a virus. Uh, and so to be quite honest, before it really started to, to hit us, you know, I'm like, okay, this is most likely going to be okay. This is the United States of America. We, this is a virus. We will be able to handle this. But after seeing this, this is not like your normal flu. This is not like your normal coronavirus. This is something very, very unusual, very different, very enigmatic. We don't know how this thing behaves. Even when you think things are going in one direction, they can change in a moment's notice. So absolutely not. This is not like your normal flu. Um, and as much as I would love to be able to, you know, hug my children again, uh, when I, you know, when I come home, when they come running to the door, I'm unable to do so because I don't want them to be exposed. As much as I would love to get together with my family, um, you know, like he, the Dr. Ali is saying, we're all affected by this, even the people on the front lines, for, you know, in addition to the public. So we get it. But if we go back to normal too quickly, too soon, and I don't know what that what, what the mark is of that, I'll leave that to the, you know, the epidemiologic and uh, infectious disease uh, specialists. Uh, I don't know what that mark is going to be, but if we do it too early, it, 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 it will, we'll have to redo this all over again. And that's definitely not something I want to do. And I'm sure many people do not want to do. You know, there's talk about antibody testing now and detecting and, you know, doing surveillance and tracing and isolation. But there are some communities that have no trust uh, with our government uh, on even medical issues. Uh, communities who feel that uh, governments in the past have deliberately injected syphilis uh, into um, communities, um, um, in introducing so many other kinds of poisons, uh, drugs, crack, things like that into communities. So how, how do we as a public policy organization, MPAC, Muslim Public Affairs Council, deal with this issue from uh, a policy perspective, when on the you know you have one extreme uh, of uh, of of uh, of this virus that can go out of control uh, and people becoming a hazard uh, on the one hand, if you don't do surveillance, and then on the other hand, um, the other extreme of government intrusion intrusion and government using this as another excuse. Uh, for violating the rights of, of many communities who are suffering the most, as we said, many of our uh, racial minorities are suffering the most because a many of them are are essential workers. They don't have the health care that the rest of us have access to. They they live in in worse conditions than a lot of us, whether it's in terms of water or or pollution in the air. So you, you you're finding that more of them are suffering. Than, than the rest of us, but they don't trust the government. So how do we approach the surveillance era uh, of this disease and tracking and isolating uh, when needed in a, in a thoughtful way? 
you have put the question very nicely, very, very nicely. And, and the answer is in the question. The, the, the only way to do that is by the people whom they believe. And these people believe they're primary care physicians. These people believe they're community clinics. We should be opening more community clinics, the free community clinics. We should be letting the primary care physicians talk with these people and explain it to them what we are doing. And I think if we do a good job of explaining it to them, like we are doing it right now uh, in the emergency room and in our clinics, when we talk with them on the, on the telephone every day, that if you are a diabetic, if you have black lung, if you have cancer, these are the symptoms you need to look for. So if we are going to explain, of course it takes time. It takes much longer time to talk with the patients because every patient has 20 other questions once you start talking with them. But this is our duty. You, you just keep your calm and you talk with them. I think talking with the patients and explaining it to the patients, making more flyers, um, that is the only way to explain to the patients that what is needed and what we are following right now and what we expect what can happen. I'm glad you men mentioned that because we're, we're starting a, a human security campaign advocating for the empowerment of community health clinics. And you just reinforced uh, how that is the right move. Let everything happen at the local level. The federal government should be only involved in providing the resources uh, for local community health clinics to do the work and to win that trust of communities that have been suspicious of government all along, especially the federal government. So thank you for that. Uh, the reason why I'm saying that is that because Appalachian Regional Healthcare is a, is a rural health organization. So we deal with all these clinics who go deep down into the rural areas. And we have nurse practitioners and nurses who go down and do all these things. So when from the top, the, the order comes in that we have to do these, these, these things, then all the doctors sit down and we make the, all the agenda. That helps a lot. That really helps a lot. I want to add on top of this is kind of one of the one of the hot topics for me uh, and a pet peeve for me is, uh, you know, mashallah, the conspiracy theories have, you know, been plentiful during this whole thing. And I want to urge caution for everybody to please, you know, don't listen to them. And number two, please don't propagate them. Uh, you know, you know, with with all these uh, messaging apps and all that, it just it just it's a roller coaster. So I, I you know I plead to our communities to kind of centralize more their information from either their primary care doctors or you know webinars like this or uh, you know uh, one other doctor and myself in in our community uh, came out with a you know a. a, a like an update video of some information that people should know about. People should more rely on that stuff than what they're hearing from anywhere else. Um, they can, you know, listen to it, but you know, proceed with caution because there's a lot of very, very bad and actually dangerous information out there that can be uh, disastrous if we kind of go along with those things. Uh, I want to make uh, one last point and 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 question um, before I hand it back to Iman, who will who will then. Uh, give us the questions from our audience. Uh, but um, are, are both of you uh, doctors who came in from a, the foreign uh, doctors program, people who, who, who got education abroad and then came here and had to get recertified or, or get certified here in the US? Or did you go, did you do your training in the US? Um, I think Dr. Saadi was born here. So he mm -hmm. must have gotten all his education here. But I was born in Pakistan, so I got my education abroad, then I took my exams and I came here. Because uh, there's, uh, there, there's talk, uh, yeah, sorry, all Dr. Sadi. All my education has been here, but I, I was born in Iraq, but I came here when I was uh, a little over a month old. So yeah. but all my education, the medical education has been here. Yeah, by the way, uh, same here. I, uh, uh, my parents fled Iraq in 63, I was, I was three years old. Uh, so, and I'm from Baghdad, and my uncle's name was Haidar. He was shot to death in prison by uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, regime. But, uh, story. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have I'm, I'm sure there are many stories in yeah. all families dealing with that. But my, uh, back to the original point is that, you know, medical schools are now uh, uh, accelerating their graduations and basically sending 
their doctors into the field, basically, again, wartime policy. We're just sending people to go and do the work. We don't have time to do the, even the graduation and, and all the accolades and maybe not even full uh, experience of medical school and, and internships and res residencies. They're just sending them out. So can we use this reservoir of foreign doctors who are here awaiting their certification and get them on a fast track so they can also help out in this crisis? You know, um, since 9-11 happened, they have cut down the residencies a lot because the residencies comes through Medicare and Medicare has cut down the residencies a lot. So a lot of foreign graduates could not come to America because of that. So they started going to Europe, they stayed at home. But I think that since this thing has happened and um, I think the Medicare will need a lot of doctors because the, the community clinics, the rural hospitals, the bigger hospitals, everyone needs doctors. Now, it was before that people will come to rural areas because of the J1 waivers. But now there are no doctors even to come for J1 waiver. So I think they are in the next, for the next four or five years, they always come, it always comes in a wave. They open it up for four or five years, then they close it down. So I think for the next four or five years, they are going to accept a lot of doctors from from other countries and then um, to fill up this gap and then they will stop. Well, thank you both for your time. I'm sorry, Dr. Sadi. I, I mean, I didn't, I, I have not even actually thought about that and that's a very interesting concept and I think that's definitely something that should be looked into for sure. Thank you. Uh, listen, I wanna thank both of you for, for your time and for your service. I consider you heroes uh, not only for our community, but for the country. And that's exactly what we want to do at the Muslim Public Affairs Council is to really highlight the heroic efforts of our community. And we produce leaders, not just for our mosques, but for all of America. And, and I'm very proud to, to have you both join us. So I'm gonna let, hand it back to Iman for the question and answer. Oh, yes, thank you both so much for joining us today. So our questions have been um, just popping. Lots of people have stuff to ask, but let's begin with a bit of a policy oriented question, which I know you're in the medical field. So um, not that they don't intersect, they absolutely do, but, but we'll start with this. You know, right now we have the panic of health at the forefront of our concern. But once inshallah this pandemic passes, we will still be left with the second wave of consequences you know, like trauma, financial constraints, um, some especially hitting certain communities harder than others. As a health professional, what policy recommendations would you have to alleviate and prevent some of the suffering that has happened? You know, we should learn a lot from this, this thing. Even like Dr. Sadi said that before, you know, all this started, we all thought, oh, that's China. They cannot handle it. In America, we will be able to handle everything. We all laughed about it until it hit us. And it hit New York, which is the main economic center of America, and people started dying left and right. Then we understood that this thing does not look at the religion or the sex or the height or anything. It just kills. Of course, we see a lot of people who are in low socioeconomic status, they are having much more worse um, effect from it. I think like Dr. Slam said that we should have more community clinics in there. Um, we should put more attention to all these people, uh, not only the people who can afford boutique clinics, but, but these people where um, the socioeconomic status is very low that we, we can work with them much more because these are the people who have much worse diabetes, much worse hypertension, much worse other diseases um, than, than the people who are in higher socioeconomic status. And the trauma will be for a long time. It's, it's not that opening it on 1st of May or 1st of June, the things will get better. No, it will not. Um, it, it, will be, it will be felt for years because the things which we have um, seen here will be, will be felt for a very, very long time. A lot of changes will be made in the policies of the hospitals and the clinics. Uh, and I hope we learn from it. I hope um, that 
the things which we are seeing here will not be put under the carpet because of the money saving measures. I think we learn from it and, and change things. I, I, I practice medicine. I'm, I'm definitely not a politician, um, but you know, I, I, whether you want to call it universal health care or, what, or whatever form of that uh, exists, I think making sure that everybody has access to health care so that you know, these trends that we're seeing in certain patient populations don't happen because these people are now aware of their you know, medical issues and comorbidities that can be more prepared to be able to handle uh, when handle it when something so so massive comes like this, and uh, I think that would be definitely uh, help help with this situation moving forward. Dr. Osadi, you use an interesting term here. You said the term comorbidity. Now, for many of us who are looking at the news or reading articles about who has kind of faced the brunt of fatalities, we are seeing disproportionately communities of color. You know, we mentioned earlier, African American communities are very hard hit. And, and I want now for you to share, if you can, with our viewers that it's not so much um, that it's, you know, a genetic predisposition or that it's um, anything that's the patient's quote unquote fault. Often there is this notion of comorbidity where there are so many variables that can lead a certain individual more um, vulnerable to COVID-19. And if you don't mind, could you possibly share with us what communities, what um, patient kind of mold would you say right now is at the height of being most vulnerable um, for, for being diagnosed with COVID-19? From, from my experience, just firsthand, uh, you know, obese patients who have high blood pressure, <laughs> And those, those patients who are obese and have high blood pressure likely have undiagnosed sleep apnea. I have sleep apnea. I wear a CPAP. Uh, and and um, it's definitely something that, that uh, I think a lot of people have uh, undiagnosed. Um, you know, the, I'm just trying to get back to you, the, the first part of your question. Um, it's, you know, comorbidities, you know, it's hard to say especially in African Americans, for example, you see there is a genetic part of it that these people get high blood pressure at a very young age and don't even know it, even at a young age. And uh, it, that's just been what I've been seeing. And I, I'm sure that exists in other patient populations as well. So with, with ha having all these medical issues and not knowing it um, and not being on treatments for it, uh, you know, that puts their, their bodies at risk uh, whenever they do get hit by something like uh, COVID-19 or other um, infections or other issues that can uh, exacerbate those, those medical problems. And, and Dr. Ali, what are you seeing in, in rural America? Who, who do you think is the most susceptible for this kind of uh, disease? Say in our community, we have more, because it was a coal mining area. So we have more of pneumoconiosis, which is black lung. Um, people love to smoke around here, low socioeconomic status. So a lot of smoking, a lot of black lungs. So the lungs were already bad. We were already battling that thing. 80% um, of our practice was either diabetes or black lung. And then when this thing hit us, that's why we had, we were so afraid that our hospital will be overwhelmed with the patients of COVID-19 uh, because of these two things. Everyone ha either has diabetes or black lung. But by the grace of God, um, because of the social distancing, um, maybe the panic which was which was created initially has helped us. Um, of course, it was, it was bad in the panic sense, but it has helped us uh, because the people have stayed at home. The roads are empty. Uh, even the Walmart is empty, which was our biggest thing here. Um, and that has helped us a lot. Patients are understanding that they cannot come to the hospital. They have to make phone calls. They are calling the emergency room. We have a special respiratory center now next to the emergency room. So any patient who has 
cough, congestion, fever, does not have to go through the emergency room. They can only go to the respiratory center. And like Dr. Sadi was saying that uh, the place where you can get your COVID-19 testing. So that's what we have made here. But low socioeconomic status does not mean only that you have diabetes. It, it means that, that a lot of patients are not very educated. So when you explain it to them something once or twice, it is hard for them to grasp because it has not happened with them before. So when you have to tell them that, listen, in, in one double wide trailers, six people are staying, that you cannot do that, um, that you have to wash your hands, you have to keep distance. Um, if you have cough, congestion, this and that, isolate yourself. It is very hard for them. These are the people who are living with six kids on, on $400 a month. So it seems it seems that you know the reality of of COVID nineteen for for both communities, rural and um, a metropolitan space, is is you know very hard hitting. We see on Twitter, Facebook, th these photos of you know the masks and the bruises of healthcare workers. We see how tired people get. Um, I want to ask each of you. You know, we have many viewers who are who are tuned in with us today, and I'm sure some of them are, are also healthcare professionals. So from your perspective. Um, Actually, when I asked both um, Dr. Ali and Dr. Al-Sabi for their bios, they both mentioned family members and, and their kids. And so I, I wanna ask during this time, you know, when the panic of the hospital is happening, what is it that, that you use to keep yourself not only motivated, but you know, mentally well and healthy as well? Is it, is it uh, faith-based? Is it exercising? What, what are you using and what do you advise um, other medical professionals to, to utilize as well? You know, um, in the clinic, when you're working the clinic and you're doing a lot of telemedicine, you keep yourself very busy. You're very busy managing your clinic policies, this and that. But the thing which really makes you afraid and tired is the emergency room. Uh, we have 24 hour shifts in, the, in, the, in our hospital. I think this is one of the only hospitals in the and regional healthcare chain where there are 24 hour shifts. Um, and when these patients come in, um, in, in the 20 rooms around you who are coughing and um, even when you close their doors, you have to go in from one room to another, um, that stresses you out. Um, my most stressful days are the days when I'm working in the emergency room. Um, in the hospital, I, I don't feel bad or in the clinic, but the emergency room is the most stressful days because everyone is coughing, everyone is having fever, everyone is having shortness of breath. Before that, we will see shortness of breath because of black lung, because of CHF, but now when anyone comes in with, with that, at once you think of that. And then you think of your family, the other people who are working with you, and that stresses you a lot. So, um, you know, I'm very uh, passionate and I love emergency medicine. Um, you know, the, that, that's just something I uh, kind of, you know, uh, gravitated towards after going through training. Uh, I, I thought I was going to be going into primary care and, you know, when I did emergency medicine. So, you know, this is kind of what, what I think I was meant to do. This is what medicine, we're actually, you know, kind of seeing truly, sick people and we know that we can do what we can to help these people you know before it was you know sprinkled in with a bunch of other stuff that wasn't so severe and some people use the emergency department for primary care reasons um you know and and that goes back to some the some of the socioeconomic uh and lack of knowledge kind of thing um but we're we're practicing medicine and the, and the residents i work with they're they're being able to experience something I never got to experience as a resident. And they get to train um, on how to treat really sick people. And so, um, you know, I think this has been uh, an opportunity to be able to, to uh, help as much as possible. As far as trying to stay safe, there's, I would say, if I was to think of a couple of things, Number one, we've made our whole emergency department a quote unquote hot zone. So we're, we're wearing those N95 masks at all times, uh, whether we're inside of a patient's room or not. Unfortunately, 
we have to maintain that same mask when these ones are meant truly for one at a time kind of thing. Um, but unfortunately, the resources uh, here are very limited, uh, even in, in such a large system. Um, number two, uh, you know, I, I, with me and my staff, we try to have as much quote unquote fun as possible. We try to laugh, we try to joke. You'll see a lot of these memes going out, um, you know, on people's, you know, trying to keep things a little bit light because uh, stress is not good for your immune system. And so uh, as much as you can to try to lighten things up, I think is very important. So that, that has been very helpful to me um, and, uh, and our staff and uh, mashallah, the, the community has you know, come together. Now there's a lot of support for the medical community, uh, whether it's from you know, flyers versus uh, these uh, long lines of uh, emergency vehicles going through, thanking everybody. Uh, a lot of people have been donating food to our department uh, to keep the staff, you know, uh, full of uh, food and energy. Uh, all of that, just kind of that up-spirited mood. Everybody's really working together. Uh, it's just been, it's been a great experience. We've been working with closely with people that uh, we know, don't usually work with. And it's just, it's been very humbling and um, very fulfilling, alhamdulillah. Well, I am so glad to hear that you guys are receiving the support that you need. Um, and you know, there you have it, folks. These are our heroes on the front line for our viewers who are watching. Um, I wanna go ahead and thank Dr. Uh, El Sadi and Dr. Ali for joining us and serving so valiantly in your communities. You are most certainly needed. Um, and, and I hope we can bring you on again with some better news when this has passed, inshallah. Um, it is our honor to highlight heroes like you all. And we just continue to, to keep you in our prayers and, and keep your fight going. Um, again, for any of you who have ideas about upcoming webinars, I encourage you to reach out at hello at mpac.org and join us on Wednesday for our webinar with the Innocence Project. Thank you so much and have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Ali and Dr. Al-Sadi. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Our pleasure.